We're going to discuss the concept of eccentricity and obliqueness. These are often concepts that are kind of confused with each other. Eccentricity means it's how uh, circular or how elliptical the orbit of a planet is. So if we draw the Earth and we draw the Sun and we want to see the circularity of the orbit of the Earth around the Sun. If it's a perfect circle, the eccentricity is zero for perfect circle. Okay, as the circle gets more and more and more and more elliptical, it begins looking like a straight line. The eccentricity approaches one. As the eccentricity approaches one, the circle becomes a straight line. Okay, so uh, the uh, obliqueness, obliqueness is how spherical the actual planet is, not the orbit of the planet. Okay, if the if a planet is perfectly spherical. The obliqueness is zero, and as the obliqueness approaches one, the planet begins looking more like a straight line, more and more and more and more oval. So the, the highest obliqueness you can have is one, where the planet would just be like a flat uh, uh, planet, the highest eccentricity that you would have, let me write down eccentricity, and the highest eccentricity you would have is 1, and then the, if the eccentricity is 1, the uh, planet's orbit would look like pretty, the sun is here, the planet would be here, and basically the sun would be at one of the focal points, and the orbit of the planet would look like a straight line. So as the planet gets more and more elliptical, as the planet's orbit gets more and more elliptical, the orbit looks like a straight line. So let's now do the actual formal definition for obliqueness. Boreal radius minus the polar radius divided by the average radius. So that's the formal definition of the obliqueness. Equatorial radius minus polar. So if you have a certain planet like this, and if the equatorial, the equatorial radius is the distance from uh, one side to the other side. Well, since it's radius, we can go from the center, from the center to the edge, that would be the equatorial radius. And then the polar radius would be this one. Now most planets, since they're spinning about their uh, axis going this way, right? They're spinning this way. What end ends up happening is the equatorial radi radius bulges outward. The polar radius is smaller and the planet looks more like this in reality. So the equatorial radius ends up being bigger. So let's see what, what the data is for the Earth. The equatorial radius for the Earth, 0.1 kilometers. The polar radius is equal to 6,356.8 kilometers is equal to uh, 6378.1 minus 6356.8 divided by 6378.1 plus 6356.8 divided by 2 because we're dividing by the average radius. Okay? So when we calculate that, we get 63.6.8. And we get 0 .00, 0 0.003345, which is approximately 0 
uh, roughly about 333, or you could round it to 334. Um, if you look at the data books uh, of the oblateness of planets, you will see that the oblateness of the Earth is not one of the most oblate, but it's not the most spherical either. So it's about 0.0034 or 0.0033. Oblateness of Saturn is the most oblate. Okay, oblateness of Saturn is equal to about 0.1. Why could that be? Well, it is a gaseous planet. So what you would have to look at to kind of understand this is that if the planet is gaseous, and you have to also look at its density, if it's not a very dense planet, and if the planet also spins quickly, uh, Saturn is about either the quickest or second quickest orbiting planet. Jupiter also spins quicker, quickly, but Saturn is less dense than Jupiter, okay? For its uh, mass, its volume is the largest, or you can say it has a small mass to volume ratio, so the Saturn's density is very low. If its density is low and it also spins quickly, it's likely to bulge out more, so that would explain why Saturn is the most oblate planet. Uh, out of the planets, the least oblate would be Mercury and Venus, their approach oblateness of zero. Mercury and Venus, roughly close to zero. Okay, so they're more spherical. Okay, now let's look at eccentricity. Minus distance perihelion divided by distance aphelion plus distance perihelion. And the planet is here. The closest approach is um, perihelion. The furthest approach is aphelion, okay? So you're going to subtract the two and then divide it by their sum, okay? So for the Earth, the perihelion distance is 1.471, 1.471 times 10 to the 11 meters, the aphelion distance is equal to 1.521 times 10 to the 11 meters. So you can see there is a difference here, okay? So the eccentricity is gonna be their difference, 1.521 times 10 to the 11, 11, 10 to the 11, 10 to the 11 cancels out. Notice that the units also cancels out. So this one was meter, this one was meter, and it becomes unitless. Same thing for uh, oblateness. Oblateness was defined as the difference of the radii divided by the average radius, so um, the oblateness is also uh, unitless. So if the top is kilometers, the bottom is kilometers, they cancel. If the top is meters, the bottom is meters, they cancel. So you should end up with a unitless constant and a unitless constant. Okay, when you do this, you end up getting a number 0.0167, which is the eccentricity of the Earth. Now, out of the planets, Venus has the most circular orbit. The eccentricity of Venus is equal to 0 0.007. Very, very circular. So we saw that the oblateness of Venus is very oblate. I mean, it's very non-oblate. It's very spherical. Okay. And the eccentricity of Venus is very low, so its orbit is its orbit is very circular, and the planet itself is very circular. Okay. Uh, besides that, out of the planets, Mercury has the highest eccentricity. Eccentricity of Mercury. Pluto is very eccentric also, which is why one of the reasons that Pluto was demoted and to become a dwarf planet. Its orbit was too elliptical. So Pluto, 0.248. Its orbit's eccentricity resembles the eccentricity of those of comets and other uh, asteroids or other non-planetary objects. But out of the planets, Mercury it has the 
most eccentricity, Venus is the least. Uh, Earth is somewhere in the middle between the two. Uh, most people are surprised by this very next question. When you say, when does the Earth, when does aphelion occur for the Earth? Okay? And when does perihelion occur for the Earth? And a lot of people are going to uh, answer this way. They're going to say, well, Earth reaches aphelion probably sometime during winter. That's why it's cold. Uh, so they're going to say something like December, January. And if, when you say, when does the Earth reach the closest to the sun, there, most people are usually going to answer sometime in June, July, August. It ends up actually being opposite. Aphelion for the Earth ends up occurring July 4th, which is Independence Day for America, okay? So I tell my students always that's when America became far from England and we celebrate our independence from England. Aphelion occurs around July 4th. Perihelion occurs January 3rd, or on or about January 3rd, so about six months later. So, uh, and then people get surprised because that's actually one of the coldest months. But that's only for the Northern Hemisphere. For the center, Southern Hemisphere, that's when they are experiencing their summer. And when they're experiencing their summer, they're closer to the sun. So their summer, you can argue, is going to be a little warmer than the summer for the Northern Hemisphere. So that's another lecture for another day. Why do seasons occur? And uh, we'll explain that another uh, day. But uh, this is kind of a surprising fact for most people. So now you can see the difference between eccentricity and oblateness and how they're similar and how they're different. Thank you very much.